So the aim of today, as Pete said, is from, from my first-hand experience of motivation, perseverance, mobilising resources and financial literacy um, or you know, potential lack of it. That's a bit of a spoiler alert for later. Um, so I think I've got about 25, 30 minutes. I'll try and keep it to time. Um, maybe have time for a question or two at the end. Um, so the question you probably got at, at the start is, you know, who is this guy? Um, why do we care what he has to say? Um, and more importantly, how can I help you? So all valid questions. So um, personal quick intro. Uh, obviously, I'm Simon Gardner, father of two boys, a one-year-old and a two-year-old. Um, I graduated, as Peter said, from the University of Portsmouth in 2006 um, with a 2-1 business administration. Um, I, I actually finished my degree in the Richmond building, but we actually started um, on the old Milton campus um, in Goswell's Road, which is now flat. So that's how old I am. Um, I was honoured to, uh, to be asked to be part of the university's Entrepreneur and Residence Scheme. Um, and this is something I am really enjoying and have been since January. Um, as, as it's been touched upon, I'm the co-founder of, of a recruitment company, Carrington West. We're based in North Harbour uh, in Cosham, uh, 1000 Lakeside. Um, and we supply both interim and permanent professionals to companies and local authorities um, in the built environment sector. Um, I've got one or two other business interests now covering property and hospitality. Um, but really, whenever I say who I am and what I do, it can come across as fairly dull when, to be honest, uh, the, 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 the kind of journey that I've been on and the lessons and the mistakes we've made are anything but. So to answer your question, why should you invest in the next uh, in me in the next 25, 30 minutes? I suppose the highlights so far are um, our, our company now does £1.5 million pounds a week um, in sales. Um, our annual sales budget this year is 75 million um, and we've got a great team of of 85 people here we have 1200 um, external contractors uh, around the uk we we won the uk's best learning and development program uh, for our internal team here we won that back to back um, and that was irrespective of industry um, in 2020 and 2021 um, former women uh, for, former winners of of that award um, our organisations such as Lloyds Bank and things. So we, we've done really well in that respect in our learning and development. Um, we've been awarded the best recruitment company to work for in the UK. And we've also won that twice as well. Um, and we hold a platinum investors and people accreditation. Only 2% of employees in the UK hold this. Um, and so, you know, reasonably big headlines. We don't think we've even got going yet, but rewind a fair few years. And this all started this company started in a garage in South Sea. Okay, it started in my brother's garage, um, and all we had were two personal laptops, two temporary fold-out tables. We had our personal mobiles, and we had to actually wear fingerless gloves because we started in the January. It was very, very cold. Um, we had to make phone calls um, and type and things, um, and also protect ourselves from the cold. So. I do appreciate both the excitement and the struggle at being at the very, very beginning of this journey. So let's get into it then. So motivation, um, I'll come on to what motivates me shortly, but the answer really as to how I maintain my motivation, really um, the short answer, sorry to disappoint, is that I don't maintain my motivation. Um, and that's something I know about myself um, but it's simply f impossible for me um, to maintain my motivation uh, constantly. I think anyone that says they're constantly motivated in terms of a particular product, service, startup, job, degree course often, um, is probably lying to themselves, I have to say. <clears throat> I have days where I can't be bothered. We, Of course I do. Um, I have days where the babies have kept us up all night. I've got days where sometimes I just want to burn the whole thing to, to the ground. Um, I've got lots, of, I've had lots and lots of days where I've approached the end of the day and I thought, oh, I'm not coming back tomorrow, I'm going to quit. Um, so we all have those moments. <clears throat> you see, the fundamental problem with motivation is that it doesn't always last very long, okay? If we look at motivation like a phone battery, motivation for me is like, you know, uh, an iPhone four or five years ago, where by lunchtime, the entire battery was completely dead. Okay. Motivation only really lasts an hour or two. Um, if, if you come back from, you know, a seminar and one of these happy, clappy, jumping, sort of positive thinking seminars or a nice holiday in the sun, it might last, if you're lucky, 
until Wednesday. But the harsh reality of the size of the task you have can often hit home once again, and it will hit home for the 1,000th time. Okay, so if I only ever worked when I was motivated, I would work probably, no lie, about 10 hours a week. Okay, so how do I manage that and how should other people manage that? So when we interview someone for a role here and they say, I'm highly motivated, in my head, I'm thinking this is you know, it's a good start, but what about when things get tough, which they always do, okay? The other fashionable thing to say when people are trying to get a job here is I'm a self-starter, right? Well, that's that's good. That's good for you. I'll be honest again, confession time, um, I'm not always a self-starter. I don't wake up with that motivation to win the morning and win the day like you hear other entrepreneurs talk about. That's why I practically refuse to work from home. I can't. Okay, I have to be around other people personally. I have to feed from the brilliance and the drive of the people we have here. Okay, one quick conversation in the lift, one sight of someone on the phone and already working at 7.30 in the morning, I'm off, I'm ready, and I'm fighting. Okay, so I'm not a self-starter. My motivation does run out. Um, And I have that knowledge and awareness of myself to know that that's the case. So it's well worth doing uh, a little mini mind audit and getting to know yourself better and what really makes you tick. I think that will be invaluable. So for me, the holy grail isn't motivation. For me, the state I strive for is momentum. Okay, momentum. So this is the way I see it. It's almost like a traffic light system in my mind. So motivation, uh, as you can see on the slide, number one, it's the spark. It's the key in the ignition. That will get the engine started, but it's not going to make your car uh, go very far. Okay, when motivation is gone and it will trip, it will falter. Then really it's self-discipline that kicks in and it's self-discipline that the top performers have in abundance. Self-discipline. How disciplined are you truly? Okay, you need to be honest with yourself. The good news is I found for me, discipline is a muscle that can be exercised. It can be trained. Um, if it keeps, uh, if you keep promises to yourself, you'll build self-discipline. Okay. I see every day as an opportunity to build, either build my self-discipline or have it risked, um, being eroded away, maintaining good habits, looking after yourself, going to the gym when you said you'd go, going for a walk when you said you'd go, meeting a friend when you said you would, keeping mini promises to yourself is the start of building self-discipline. Okay. Planning your day and sticking to the plan within reason and with what is permit, you know, what what can be done builds discipline. When you hear people say, you know, I ground it out. I stayed late. I got my head down. Okay. That's the discipline of oneself when your reasons are bigger than your internal excuses. Okay. So once you've, once you've got through self-discipline and you've ground it out, you don't sit in that state forever. You, you build confidence from, from doing what you said you do and momentum, soon arrives okay it's the third level i think the ultimate goal is momentum momentum once it's underway is very very tough to break okay we've we've all been there you know writing a dissertation a sales proposal on the phone to a client the words are just flowing you know your dream hire calls back accepts the role you know everything just lands into place you your team the company you feel invincible okay you've reached that flow state Okay, your flow state is the reward in my mind for going through that long, dark tunnel called self-discipline. Setting new habits is hard. Building confidence and discipline is hard. But as humans, once the habit is formed, the repetitive nature, the habitual nature um, of execution on your daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly tasks and therefore your annual goals becomes much easier. Okay, it's now habit. Top performers that I've worked with, top performers and entrepreneurs that I've you know met and things and follow, you know these people, they you know and, and and also the people that you just see and you know that that will succeed, they will reach their flow state quickly, and they'll do anything in their power to stay there once they've hit that hot vein of form. Let's say, okay, I've seen people cancel holidays, weekends away. Right. I've seen people ignore the fact it's Saturday or Sunday if they're in this vein of form and just run a 14 day working week purely because they're in that flow moment. OK, top performers see momentum as a gift and they'll try and maintain it at all costs. So you've started the engine with motivation. You've driven the first few miles on self-discipline. Um, and once that motivation runs out, because it always will, 
you you'll finish the race with momentum okay um and you can start again the whole process further down the line um if if you need to quite so motivation to me is a dangerous word um you don't need motivation if you have momentum you don't need motivation if you can exercise self discipline when you need to self discipline really is the key um tool to have in your box and as i said it can be trained um as you can tell i could talk about this for hours we haven't got ages but i think personal performance within entrepreneurship in my opinion is everything it's the separator between those that actually do succeed and those that just talk about succeeding and there's a hell of a lot you know enough of those guys out there at the moment um so i think the key to the answer really is to focus on what keeps me engaged rather than motivated okay what makes me turn up day in day out these days obviously back in the garage it was very different we simply had no choice um but what makes me come in day in day out now continuing to work continuing to lead when really to be honest you know i could finish at any time and probably never have to work again okay as a human i have to feel part of something bigger than me part of a movement a mission and that's what i feel here that's what i hope and i think all of our team feel okay we know we're on a journey together and the progress and ticking the needle forward the baby steps every day forward the lessons we learn on the way are more important these days than the money we pay ourselves to 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 be here the main reason and the answer is to what i feel engaged i think is very very simple um but it's something that a lot of people are actually ashamed to admit these days but simply i want to win okay i have a huge vision of 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 this company um we all do we all share it one that's much much larger than its current form i we the team we feel we feel pulled and pushed towards that vision every day it's a shared vision as i said it's it's agreed by all the company we want to be the best we want to strive every hour um of the day to be better than we were uh, yesterday better than ourselves and better than our competition at any point okay we we play to win um and we think as any top performer in their field they also play to win if you think about in sport ronaldo doesn't play the game of football to earn money he plays to be considered the very best the money and the success he gets from that is a byproduct um of striving to be the best mo farah is another example you know he didn't or doesn't train morning noon and night for sponsorship deal he trains to win and to be the very best and in professional sport you're paid to do that so hence it's perfectly acceptable to want to win outside of sport i think uh, where the prize can be just as big if not bigger sometimes it's been lost in the current era um that that desire to win i think especially in the uk especially more than america in america it's a different kind of culture but we're so worried here about being seen as someone that's good at something and saying you're good at something is a complete no no um you know so admitting you want to win and plan to do so is almost frowned upon okay and that represents a huge opportunity for someone with a slightly um thicker skin let's say so i think some brilliant people out there are being diluted I honestly believe that and i think you know where we live in a world of participation trophies and we no longer keep scoring kids football games for their fear of being a losing team unfortunately life and business isn't like that you do have winners you do have losers in our industry recruitment and pretty much any other industry i know you don't get a medal for trying or turning up okay so you play to win don't feel ashamed about that that's what keeps me engaged and therefore motivated um there's a nobility in winning showing others what's possible um and a rising tide as we know raises all boats you you improve each other infinitely so perseverance i've preached to you for long enough on that previous slide i'll keep this one shorter um i know there's um i was reading the the, the course guidelines the other day and i know there's a um, resilience module from josh robinson this either happened or happening um and by the way what an inspirational guy josh is uh, very very young um unbelievable um you know we need we need more of him in the country for sure um so in short when you see the word entrepreneur read resilience or perseverance okay the whole game is perseverance to answer the question how do enterprising people keep going my personal answer these days is i have no choice okay we can't give up when your team their welfare their 
wealth, their stability, their personal goals, their children all rely on you. As I said, we've got 1,200 contractors. Add that to the 85 team we have here. That's 1,300 families around the UK that require us to keep on going. Okay. Don't forget, when you grow a company, you launch a product. Um, even if you're starting small, eventually you're creating something that has its own legal identity. Right? It's something that transcends you as a person eventually. Okay. So when things get tough, I remember my why, okay, my will to win. Okay. When things become overwhelming, I remind myself of the beautiful fact that we have as human beings that in the next six, eight, 10 hours time, whatever, uh, whatever time in the future, we will probably be asleep. Okay. We only ever have today. And I think perseverance, if you write this only one sentence down from this talk, it was, uh, we only have today. People that give up, people that quit, I believe, focus on the huge end result that is needed and not the process that is required to succeed. Okay. So in tough times, when the momentum that we spoke about earlier has swung the other way and things, you know, are all going wrong, um, big deadlines, lots of issues, I just pause and I ask myself, what can I do today that's that's in my control that I can have the biggest possible impact on this issues, all these issues. Okay. So remember, you only ever have today. Yesterday was today. Tomorrow, when it arrives, will be today. And in tough times, you just deal with the present and what you can affect now. Okay. There's a great book on this um, called uh, The Power of Now. Um, now, you know, to be honest, it's a bit, it's a bit hippie. It's a bit spiritual, um, which for some people, um, they'd enjoy, but I, I persevere with it. Um, and I think it's a must read for anyone looking to dial back their sense of time, which is essentially a man-made concept. Okay. See each day as a building block, a chance to build discipline, as we said, to build focus, um, and to work on the process that's required to succeed, not the big end scary result. Okay. By focusing on the mini actions and the movements um, you need to do today, and you do that enough days in a row, the result will take care of itself. Okay. Um, I write a minimum, um, just before I leave the office, I write a minimum five, what I call DNNs. Okay. Five daily non-negotiables that I write down um, and I achieve those the next day. And I don't even think about stopping or going home until I've done those five. Any more, I see that as a bonus. But if I stop at five, I can go home satisfied that it's been a good day. I've ticked the needle forward. We're closer to the vision. Okay. Then tomorrow I'll do the same the day after, the day after, etc. I persevered and continue to persevere because I'm relentlessly consistent in the small actions. Okay. Not the big things. If you think about how, how do you run a marathon, you can think about 26 mile stacks on, on top of each other, or you can look down and focus on one foot in front of the other. Okay. Six or 700 day habit streaks for me are not uncommon. It's the small process driven actions that I focus on. And before you know it, you've looked up and you've gone from a garage to a million and a half pound a week. Okay. Now that's perseverance. So it's the micro action execution and management of that. Right. Mobilizing resources. Um, so um, just over halfway. Um, I think networking is hugely important. Um, obviously, it's amazingly, well, it's much, much easier these days in the modern era. It can be done digitally. I also think a big tip here, and probably the biggest tip I can give you on this one, is to manage your suppliers like you manage your clients or your customer. Okay. I see lots of entrepreneurs and even middle managers and, and things in, in larger companies treat their suppliers often really poorly. And I, I can't stand that. Okay. When there's a pandemic, um, uh, a, a, a staffing shortage in the country, Brexit, something that affects supply chain issues or access to funding, etc. You know, like we all have had in the last three years. Okay, I've seen some suppliers have to cut back on who they supply. That is becoming more and more common. They can't keep up with demand. So, which company are the, is first for the chop when they decide who to service and who not to service? Okay, it's going to be the client that's rude, this difficult. Um, uh, that, 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 that assumes they're entitled to this service, okay? The ones that don't pay on time, the ones that squeeze the margins, okay? Be a good client. How about inviting your suppliers like we do, okay, to your Christmas party, okay? How about taking them for lunch, sending them a thank you note, okay? If resources are limited, 
you can just leave them a review uh, or a thank you on various platforms. Manage the relationship like you would with a customer who pays you money. Um, and that will go a long, long way. OK, it's rare. People will make concessions for you. They'll bend the rules. They'll speak to their boss who won't allow you to, um, you know, um, advance something or, or you know, we don't really do orders that small. They'll do things because you've done things for them. OK, um, when it comes to mobilizing human resources, um, I'm a big, I'm going to say this, obviously, I work in recruitment, but I'm a big believer in making that hire or implementing that software, for example, that will speed up part of your process um, just before the real need presents itself. OK, that's important obviously, if the finances permit. But if you wait until there's a real um, pressing need, then um, decisions on who to hire or what system to invest in or what product you need to bring in are driven by tighter timescales and a subconscious panic. And I think quite often that will impede your decision making and mean that the results um, are rushed or could be compromised. Okay. Now, that's what I used to, that's what I believe now. But that wasn't always the case. Okay. So a quick story, a fair few years ago, we approached a finance consultant to come in and to run an audit on our financial procedures, okay? Um, and when we started, it was just two lads in a garage, then four mates, then six, blah, blah, blah. So you can imagine, um, you know, this guy came in, he was a former finance director for a very large recruitment company before leaving to become a consultant. He did a, an audit for us for about three months and he found... <laughs> lots of holes, lots and lots of holes um, in our in our financial procedures. At the end of the three months, the other, my, my, uh, my mate said, I'll be the other directors, they were keen to offer him a permanent role as finance director. Now, this was a hugely sizable investment, okay, I must admit. Um, and as much as I loved him and the work he did, in my mind, I was thinking, is the time right for this? Um, we probably had a team at the time of about 30, maybe, whereas previous company had closer to 400 people, okay? So we all agreed um, at the time, it was far more than we needed and a big cost with it. But my arm was twisted um, and we, we did hire him. OK, now, literally two weeks after he started, I went for um, my weekly roast dinner at my parents' house. And there on the table was um, uh, a letter from HMRC. Um, we've all seen them, the brown envelopes. Um, they strike fear the minute they land on the doormat. Um, they... Um, it had been given by my brother because we used to, you know, use the garage in the bottom of his garden. It'd be given by my brother to my parents to give to me. So one week went by, I didn't open it. If anyone knows me, they know I just don't open mail. I just don't do it. Um, it never brings good news. So two weeks, three weeks, after about a month, my dad said, are you going to open this letter? It looks important. I said, look, I'll take it into work tomorrow. It's my day off. I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to take it into work tomorrow, which I did. I opened the letter at work and there facing back at me was a check from HMRC for well over a hundred thousand pounds. Okay. And it had been sat um, on the table for a month. Okay. But we'd been overpaying our tax by mistake um, and a, a, on a thing on expenses. And his first role um, in his first job that he spot in, spotted instantly was to claim the refund. We never knew we were entitled to. Okay. So it was a big wake up call. Um, in, in terms of mobilizing and hiring the expert and not thinking arrogantly that you know it. Um, you, you know, you need to hire in people that are far, far um, more, more clever than you in, in, in many ways. Um, so financial literacy. Now, confession time, um, you know, this is not my area of expertise. Um, I don't understand it in detail. Um, I never have. Um, I have a basic understanding of how our company finances work. Um, but really, the company grew so rapidly, so quickly that um, it went over my head. But um, it would have been considered pure insanity in the end not to bring in our finance director and the team of, I think we've got 13 people now in the finance team. Um, so we get monthly management accounts, we get board reports, PLs. But honestly, the things I learned in college and then at uni were probably all I needed to get me this far. Okay. So pay close attention if you're doing anything like that. Um, I understand how finance works from a basic perspective, obviously. Um, and one of our keys to success, I believe, is our appetite for risk. Okay. So financial literacy and appetite for risk are one and the same. So very soon after launch, um, for example, we had to sign personal guarantees of £70,000 each, which at the time, 
was I walk away. We, we just couldn't afford it. I owned a small flat, but apart from that, I didn't have the money that I was uh, guaranteeing anyway. So from that point onwards, the worry was gone. <laughs> um, I think one of the most common misconceptions people have when they set up um, is, uh, and, and understandably, the, the, the lack of previous exposure to the figures that you'll very quickly start to have to deal with. Okay, so um, it's it's. Um, you know, the figures about how to run a business um, and the cost of production and things like this are a hell of a lot more than how to run a, you know, a one bedroom flat, for example. And I think this is especially true when you're a student or you've just graduated. Okay. It's very common and very easy to attribute the same emotional, um, the same emotion and the same feelings towards a financial figure um, and, and see it through a personal finance eyes. Okay. So £1 million to me personally huge sum of money um, or let's say 20,000 pounds to a student leaving university, you know, it's very easy to think, God, it would take me X number of years to earn that as a, in my part-time job working at view cinema in between lectures, of course. But the key I think is to look at these figures through a different lens and to make a decision with a business hat on. Okay. Now that can really exercise your risk muscle and prompt you maybe to become more comfortable with larger business figures more quickly. You know, our facility now is 10 million a month um, and anything, you know, but years ago, it was half a million pounds a month, which, again, was beyond worry free for me because I, <laughs> but there was nothing we could personally do to remedy it if it went wrong. So the 10 million pound a month is exactly the same. So I think usually the most successful people have the most calculated um, uh, debt sometimes and they feel the most comfortable with debt. Um, but that doesn't mean I gamble. You know, we go to the races, we take the team. I, sometimes I might put on a fiver just, you know, to be, you know, and feel like I've done it, but I never gamble. So gambling and, and calculated risk are two hugely different things. OK, um, right. So um, I want to leave some time for some questions. Um, you know, you can contact me um, and I've talked to you, you know, for, for, for probably long enough. Um, so. Um, I'd encourage anyone to reach out and if they want to reach out to me, you can do so on, on Instagram, uh, side.gardener. I, I love hearing about people's new ventures, business ideas. I'm happy to answer questions on there. Um, there are semi-selfish reasons. I, I always ask people to reach out because as I mentioned, I actually feed from the enthusiasm of others. Okay. Our company is way out of the startup phase and it's into the more sort of corporate uh, SME size things. So the problems we deal with, um, Sometimes exciting, sometimes they're not. So the startup phase does excite me. Um, and so feel free to reach out and let me know anything about that. Um, I do have a podcast. I co-host it with um, a mate of mine, Ben Miles. He's a co-founder of Victorious Festival um, that some of you may have heard of. Um, some of you may have even been to. Um, if you wanted to hear me drone on even more, um, you can. Uh, the link to that is in my Insta profile. And um, I also want to just finish briefly on this i think i think it's important to note um that there seems to be a common misconception that success of any kind especially entrepreneurship is reserved for the very clever okay the special the privately educated the well connected okay it's really really not okay i'm proof of this um my academic grades were nothing special um, I'm not particularly clever in any one area. I didn't go to private school. Um, and I think as budding entrepreneurs or people on this program, you're at least interested in enterprise. I think we all have a duty to ensure that that message is spread far and wide. OK, um, it's really just plain old hard work and daily relentless steps towards a big vision. And to be honest, most people can do that. Right. Um, now, I noticed the aims of this program is to inspire the launch of 300 businesses eventually. And I was really, really pleased to see that. OK, I think it's become unfashionable to want to take the time and the effort to grow a big company. OK, people want to focus on crypto, NFTs, you know, Forex trading, all the sell herbal life um, in isolation. These things aren't bad, but in general, it's a shortcut. People want shortcuts to success. And I don't, and I think that shouldn't replace the social duty of building a big company, a disruptive, we can do better than you type company, one that mixes up the establishment and one that offers quality employment 
and with it showing people what's possible and also to help regenerate our towns and cities in the process okay i over the last 15 years of my c- recruitment career one at a large recruitment company um and and the rest here my role's taken me to places all over the uk okay and i can tell you that london manchester liverpool and places like birmingham aside the uk is in desperate desperate need of some hope right and i think i really feel now more than ever that the way out is through entrepreneurship okay we can't rely on the government no one's going to come along and save us i think entrepreneurship is the way that we can drive this country forward offering quality employment um and as i said not the instagram version of entrepreneurship but the real hard tough road um with the rewards and the social impacts at the end of it